The question is, do you agree that Scotland should be an independent country? For me, the principle that we work best when we work together. Well, they didn't. Very serious. The referendum. It seems to me that they're not dealing with the issues. Hello, this is Scottish Independence Podcast episode number 52, and this time, after Patrick Harvey and Jean Urquhart in recent episodes, we're going back to the Parliament again to speak to John Finney, MSP, who is the independent MSP for the Highlands and Islands region. It's a great conversation, so we'll go straight to it and have a wee word with you at the end. Uh, Hi John, how's it going? Very well, thanks. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. A bit busy this morning, but that was my own fault. Uh, apart from that, um, apparently recently you you, you made a, uh, some comments at the 2014 matters on how the Scottish government needs to do more on immigration and human rights and how Scotland could be more of a progressive beacon if it's independent. Would you like to expand on what you said? Well, well, yes, it was, a, it was in a very good discussion involving um, John Waltz from Scottish Refugee Council. And I was expressing my concerns as a, an elected representative that um, following a letter from Dominic Grieve, the Home Secretary a while back, the UK Border Agency won't engage with elected representatives of the devolved administrations. Now, given that there are a number of issues that we would seek to, to raise on people's behalf, I find that very disappointing. Uh, I think uh, an independent Scotland, however politically configured, would have a more compassionate approach to the issues of immigration and asylum seeking. Do you think that would also be a necessary measure given the ageing population? Although I believe it's slightly overblown. Scotland has a slightly worse situation than England, but only slightly worse. And both Scotland and England are much worse in terms of ageing population than most of the countries in Europe. Well, of course, that is a feature in my own part of the world, the Highlands and Islands, um, more so still with a, with a growing and ageing population, which, of course, is entirely welcome. It's great. People uh, live longer and, importantly, have a good quality of life. So there are opportunities uh, connected with having a, a different approach to immigration, for instance. And the approach that's adopted by the United Kingdom is one that arguably suits the southeast of England. It doesn't arguably suit the southwest of England or other parts, and certainly doesn't suit Scotland, because there's an opportunity to uh, have younger people come and supplement our our population. And indeed, there are people with schools who would go and work in rural areas where we have challenges delivering public services. So there are real opportunities there. Most of all, and a very personal thing, uh, I want Scotland to be a welcoming place. I think we sometimes have a quaint notion that we're very welcoming in Scotland, and that's not the case elsewhere in the UK. And it would be wrong to be complacent because there are people with pernicious racist views in Scotland too. So I I want us first and foremost to be welcoming and I want us to engage in the international stage. First and foremost, I'm an internationalist. So you would have been happy to see Hamza Youssef um, announcing that if we get a yes vote, they're going to be closing Dungable. Uh, the closure of Dungable um, is an absolute requirement. Uh, just shortly after I was elected, I was asked um, if I would w- would visit there by a, con- a constituent who was aware I was the convener of the Parliament's cross-party group in human rights. And uh, I have to say, um, I found it a, a very interesting experience. It wasn't the first time and certainly is not the last time that I've been in a prison, so I wasn't phased by the infrastructure Eventually, the nervous personnel from the company, who, who, who were very courteous, uh, let me see their secure facilities. There was no one in the secure facilities at the time. They weren't quite so engaging when I wrote them after to uh, perhaps their nervousness was the fact that they had two juveniles in the premises at the time. Now, I wrote to the Home Office about that and unusually got a reply. I followed up that reply, but of course, they eventually will disengage because, of course, Scotland has a different approach to the treatment of children at the moment anyway. So the vile practice of dawn raids, young kids being dragged kicking and screaming from their beds by strangers has ended. Dan Gable's still there. But of course what's happened is the problem has been transported south of the border and we had the horrendous situation last week or the week before of an 82-year-old Canadian man with dementia dying in a hospital shackled to the bed. That's no humane system of dealing with immigration uh, and that certainly wouldn't be the case in Scotland where Dungavel would be closed. So Scotland, uh, the Scottish Parliament implemented some laws to try and, I don't know, ameliorate the worst of what you find uh, in the Westminster system with regards to immigration at the moment. But um, so what would you like to see? What could independence allow us to do more in order to improve the situation in, in, in terms of specific policies? 
Well, f- for instance, the situation where our universities are welcoming to, to students, you know, non-EU students, there's the double effect there. Of, I mean, any community is enriched by the, the breadth of um, personalities and different nationalities, different cultures that are there. So not only for these people to be educated in Scotland, but to stay on for a while. Um, there were temporary arrangements granted Scotland for that a while back, which have since insisted. I think there are opportunities to help our population grow. And that would, and I, I earlier mentioned about rural communities where there are challenges connected with delivering public services. And I don't know what it says about our existing population that we do have difficulty filling posts, but that is the reality of the situation. And that obviously drawing from a bigger pool of personnel to fill vital um, positions like the delivery of healthcare in rural, remote and rural communities. That's something that uh, would, I think would make a, a big difference and certainly something that I'm very closely interested in because of the challenges we've had, for instance, in Ardnamuchan in, in North West Sutherland connected with these issues. Just to turn the focus a little bit instead of what we're doing within the borders, uh, an independent Scotland looking out with the borders, you've talked about we could make some real progress in in working in human rights areas, something that the United Kingdom, I think, is at best schizophrenic, um, you know, where there are some good measures and good activities done by DFID, but at the same time, the United Kingdom government tends to support the arms trade uh, around the world, uh, selling to some, some rather dodgy types, I'd have to say. Um, what do you think that independent Scotland should be doing better, apart from the obvious? Well, there's there's one area, um, and I I, I don't routinely um, miscall the the party I was a member of for 40 years, but there's one area that deeply disappoints me in the white paper, and that is talk about not only the retention, but the growth of the arms industry in Scotland. Now, I I have made a number of inquiries into this. I've raised a number of questions, eventually secured a, a document regarding the arms industries in Scotland that was commissioned by Scottish Enterprise. So, what I would first and foremost like to see is Scotland not contributing to the world's problems, and the world's problems are associated with the military expansionism. But the key to all this is who's in charge. And multinational corporations, the banks, the arms industry, eh, have far too powerful a role in the, the globe. I would like an independent Scotland to be outreaching. I would like the first contact that anyone abroad has with a Scottish Defence Force personnel in khaki that they have a humanitarian rucksack in their back rather than a rifle in their hands. And, and I think that would be a, a positive start. First and foremost, if you go way back to the, the, the Willie Brandt position of, of a, a certain percentage of your GDP being spent abroad. And unusually, the UK isn't as remiss uh, on that issue where they have maintained the budget. Of course, there's issues about how it's delivered, but the UK is to be uh, at least acknowledged for that. And indeed, the role they played in the arms treaty and i have to say um alistair burke the home office minister who unfortunately isn't there is one of the few people i found in my correspondence with uk government ministers ministers not only to be informed but showing genuine interest and i would like to see scotland contribute with our um, sister nations in the united kingdom to be a force for good uh, around the globe i was at a meeting recently where someone talked about the loss of a seat at the united nations well, it's the gaining of a seat that interests me. I want Scotland to take its role there and work collaboratively around the globe to deal with the many challenges that are there. These challenges don't stop at borders. The challenges of climate change, with migration that will go with that, with challenges of the future, continuity of energy, food and water that are going to only be resolved by global cooperation rather than jingoistic adventures abroad by military forces. Do you think one of the major problems with the United Kingdom at the moment is that a lot of these issues are simply ignored or it's waiting for the the markets to resolve them when they clear, well, to me at least, they're not showing any particular desire to do so? Well, capitalism is a deeply flawed system. I I can't offer you another one at the moment, but you you, you have a situation where um, war and clean up after war is, is very, very good business. The port barrel politics talked about in the United States. And if, you know, a company like Halliburton, if you can be responsible for uh, the provision of the tools to create the mayhem of war and then be rewarded with the contracts to clear up after, well, that's a, a perfect feast for the, the, the corporate body. So, you know, there are occasional signs that, that there's uh, a willingness 
to engage. But there is this unhealthy competitiveness between nations. But of course, we have a number of multinational corporations who are far larger than nations. If you take, for instance, the situation of the competition involving a number of nations in the Arctic at the moment regarding uh, mineral oil reserves there, I, for instance, would like to see that to be a UN protectorate and to have the nations of the world treat it like the uh, Antarctic and it being reserved rather than being the scene of the next battle between ExxonMobil and Gazprom. Just as a slight aside to that, did you see the thing a couple of years ago? I don't know what's happened to that. Maybe you've got your finger on the pulse a bit more there than me, but that part of the Antarctic that was accidentally became part of Scotland and not part of the United Kingdom. I, was that not one of the things that when they did the review, they took back along with um, something like, what was it, the certification or authorization of dental nurses or some some such, some anomaly they found, yes, um, I, I don't want us to have any territorial claims. I want us to be working collaboratively. Um, there already is a boundary between Scotland and, and the rest of the world. It doesn't have a fence around it, it doesn't have a wall around it or a moat. And that's the way I want to keep it. I want us to work collaboratively across the globe. If you'll allow me to put it this way, um, you work collaboratively, but not work collaboratively as part of NATO. You and Jean Urquhart resigned from the SNP. As you said, you've been a member for 40 years over the changing of the policy with regard to NATO. Um, would you like to explain a bit more about why, or to recap, why you felt it was so important that you, you couldn't support the party after 40 years after that? Well, um, I find nuclear weapons an abhorrence. I'm not going to quote all the figures. They're well understood by people. Vast sums of money for weapons of widespread indiscriminate slaughter. And that's what they, that's what they are. You know, I understand that a fundamental objective of every nation is to protect its territory, uh, territorial boundaries and its citizens. And key to that would be doing a risk assessment of what the threats are. And any risk assessment uh, will show the threats to Scotland, the threats to the UK, are around issues like continuity of energy supply, food supply, cyber attack, the occasional lone wolf terrorist. There are no territorial threats posed by other nations. And if you look at the manifestation of some of these, so for instance, if you take three of the powers on the, the UN Security Council, the horrendous attack 9-11 in the US, the attacks in the Moscow cinemas with multiple deaths, the attacks in the London underground, they took place regardless of the fact that each of these powers possessed nuclear weapons. And so th this notion of deterrence doesn't square either with any risk assessment or indeed the reality of the situation. The Scottish National Party found itself as the ma majority party uh, in uh, Holyrood notwithstanding this policy that had served as well for all these years. And it's certainly I could not support a policy of membership of a, a first-rate nuclear alliance. And what I have to say is the bizarre position of being in the alliance but expecting the removal of nuclear weapons. Because there was a very, very rich prize. And I hope it's a prize that can still be delivered for an independent Scotland. And that was to play a significant role in worldwide nuclear disarmament. Because there's a, an excellent report called Nowhere to Go, which looked at the alternative locations for the UK nuclear fleet, and there is nowhere for it to go. So in very short period of time, in a matter of days, it can be disengaged. It will take years, many, many years to ultimately clear up. But the prize of disarming the UK's nuclear arsenal um, and contributing to worldwide peace, you imagine what could be done, the houses, the hospitals, the schools, the support for older people, uh, the jobs that could be created if we weren't um, spending money on armaments like the weapons that will never be used. They're not, it's talked about as UK's independent deterrent. The, the, the missiles are leased, they use US, from the US, they use US satellites and they're serviced in Georgia. It's no more independent than, uh, it simply isn't independent. And, and it's obscenity to humanity, nuclear weapons. So that's the background to my leaving the, the party. There's a, there'd also be a sense of sort of spiritual uplift, I think, in a certain sense, with no nuclear weapons on the soil. You know, we're not part of this this horrible idea. But um, can I just ask one thing? Do you think from the SNP's point of view, the move to say that they would join NATO was a kind of realpolitik calculation? You know, if, if we 
show that an independent Scotland won't rock the boat too much. You know, we'll be part of NATO, we'll play ball. They hoped to sort of establish some kind of credibility with other nations, particularly maybe United States. And if that's the case, this is a kind of long, double-pointed question, but if that's the case, do you think it, it made a blind bit of difference to the United States and what they think about the independence of Scotland? Is it a successful calculation or it, it wouldn't really make any difference to what they think anyway? Well, uh, whilst we're very engrossed, rightly, with our constitutional debate at the moment, I, I think it would be uh, naive to assume that the US, is, uh, or the vast majority of US citizens, are aware of Scotland, never mind their constitutional arrangements. There certainly is, uh, I think it's fair to say, a, a view that things continuing as they are before is, is seen as an option um, that um, is more likely to deliver a yes vote. I personally feel like that. I think if we talk about vision, we talk about uh, a different version of things. I don't want a smaller version of the United Kingdom with the elites of the bankers, the public school boys, and I stress boys, public school boys, the military holds sway where we have a situation where people are being prosecuted for collecting food out of skips whilst multinational corporations, many of whom benefit from vast state support, pay no tax. We need something different. And importantly, what we need is a move away from the arms industry determining how uh, governments can support their citizens by other ways, because the subsidies um, and the support that's given, you know, if you take, for instance, the situation in Libya there, the efforts to perhaps bring about a situation moving away from dictatorship to some form of democracy, and we would all perhaps mean different things about democracy, but his contribution to that a couple of months ago was to have a warship off Tripoli acting uh, um, as a, a host for an arms fair. You know, it, who would decide that? At what point is the uh, profit motive trump uh, humanity? Because the last thing, let me suggest, that uh, Libya needs is more armaments. So, um, Sorry, a wee bit off your initial question there. Yes, I, I, I don't doubt that the Scottish National Party believe that that's a very pragmatic approach to take. Of course, that is because the, the, the is pragmatic with regard to other nations. And of course, there is a fear that uh, President Obama would jet in a fortnight before the, the referendum and, and spoil the, 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 the eminent party. But, uh, you know, I have to say, as, as someone who's been around many hundreds, if not thousands of doors, the issue of NATO, I genuinely can't recall it coming up. The sort of issues that would be raised with me is, my dad's got a military pension, will he still get it after independence? My lad is in the RAF regiment, what will he still be able to serve there? These are the people are very practical. It's, it's practical issues that are going to determine how people uh, vote in this coming uh, referendum. We, we are where we are with NATO. I, I, I welcome the commitment that the Scottish government has given to the removal of nuclear weapons. I just simply don't think it's compatible with membership of NATO because I don't think for one second NATO will say no. NATO will say, yeah, yeah, but not just now. We'll need to discuss it. If the mighty Germany, the mighty Germany was not only able to remove the nuclear warheads, but had 24 of them upgraded following the Chicago summit of uh, last year, then we Scotland's got no chance um, because NATO's built in consensus. And uh, as a US general referred to it as Snow White, and the 27 dwarfs, well, mm. Snow White and the 28 dwarfs maybe now. Mm. Yeah, and just were you saying uh, Obama flying in, I think Cameron's actually trying to get Putin flying in at that moment. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yes, he, well, Colin support, uh, you know, um, uh, the, um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite disappointing, but of course not surprising, you know, from a, a, an imperial power that's used dirty tricks around the globe, then I wouldn't. Uh, expect any, anything different. But what we have to have is we have to have an honest debate. We have to have people engaging honestly. And yes, there's differences of opinion. I personally would like us to agree on some of the facts. And, and I think to some extent that's happened because, uh, you know, the, the David Camerons, the Alistair Darlings et al, who now say no one saying Scotland couldn't be a viable independent country. Well, actually, that's precisely what you've been saying for the last 40 years. So I welcome that change. And I think as we get nearer, we're going to see more concessions to the fact that uh, Scotland not only could be, but would be better as a result of independence. Uh, but possibly bigger and scarier project for your stories as well. Who knows? But <laughs> oh, So I think that we can guarantee that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, to come back to something you said, you, you, 
to paraphrase a touch, you were suggesting that you don't particularly like seeing corporations and arms industry being allowed to run amok, quite frankly. And suppose the solution to that is more democratic accountability. And it, at the moment, a lot of the independence debate is, is going on currency issues and EU issues. But I suppose democratic accountability is one of the fundamental pr- uh, principles in this debate, why the democratic position in Scotland is so poor from from local government right through to Holyrood, right through to uh, not getting the governments we vote for half the time or, or even more than half the time. Uh, what, what do you think is the role of democratic accountability in this debate and why is independence important for that? Well, I, I, I wouldn't be indiscreet and say which, but uh, along with a, a, another colleague, I, I was asked to London last year to, to speak to the executive of a national trade union. And I, I spoke to them uh, for about 15 minutes. I was asked to speak. And at the conclusion, there was a hushed silence. And the first person who eventually asked a question said, I don't disagree with a single word John said, but why does Scotland need to be independent? Well, the answer to that is is, is very simple. We are in a position to do things uh, differently. Already we have the infrastructure here. I don't care any less about people in Liverpool or Leamington Spa than I I do in Leith. But I would like to see Scotland's independence acting as a trigger to other areas, to clearly Wales being a a priority to uh, have more democratic control. Because first and foremost, these are a very small set of islands off the northwest coast of continental Europe. The idea that we wouldn't get on with our nearest and dearest neighbours is quite uh, nonsensical. But the idea that decisions that work for Greater London work for Kinloch Berry is nonsense too. So Scotland being independent would be the start. I would want to see more devolution of power beyond that. Uh, of course, to have democracy, you have to have engagement. And the million missing voters, going right back to the, the days of the poll tax, need to be uh, brought on board. And we have an entire generation who are not used to engaging in the democratic process. And we need to change that. And to change that, we must show that things are relevant. So for communities that have been blighted by the wicked attack, badged as welfare reform, we need to uh, get in there and explain how there are opportunities to do things better. But it's just the start of, of a longer process. I would like to see decisions made as locally as possible, but as collaboratively as possible. And as you said, you've been a member, you were a member of the uh, SNP for 40 years. And this is the question I ask everyone on the podcast, which, so as you said, for 40 years, so it's probably going back a little bit, if you don't mind me saying so. But what, Indeed. what was the moment you you decided that Scottish independence was the way to go? Because for some people, it's kind of an emotional thing. For other people, it's a very pragmatic and practical idea or something they've come to recently or a long time ago. When was it that you decided that, this was something that you really wanted to get behind and support? Well, um, um, my older sister Linda, she's three years older than me, uh, was always a nationalist. I have to say, what are we talking about here? We're talking about late 60s, early uh, 70s, where it was seen as being a bit off the wall. We were blessed by having a, a doctor who was a, a SNP activist at that time. My, my parents were to SNP. Um, and I suppose in these days, it wasn't a very informed position uh, that, that I would have taken. It was a position that we should do things on our own. Uh, it was probably unduly associated with flags and liking certain aspects and not understanding why, as a Highland laddie, I'd be governed by someone in the southeast corner of the biggest island that we lived on. So it it moves on a bit to that, to when I am a, a teenager in, in Oban, and if you remember the... U.S. forces were in the Holy Loch, and in Oban, I remember someone saying, uh, I can't remember this particular number, but it was seconds after a strike in the Holy Loch that Oban would be obliterated from the face of the earth. And it just seemed to me that there was another example of no control. And I do recall a question being asked in Parliament about then how many U.S. military facilities there were in Scotland, and the U.K. government honestly answered they didn't know because... Of course, there was various tracking posts, there was various um, bits of technical equipment. So it really, it was a slow build up to that where, if you like, a not particularly informed nationalist position as a a boy, hopefully has morphed into a, I certainly do consider myself first and foremost an internationalist. And I see no contradiction in terms in saying that. I just believe that Scotland, a, a historic nation, can do things better. 
if decisions are made by the people, just as I believe that uh, people in England will make decisions that best suit the people in England if, the, for instance, they're not having to consider factors unconnected with the geography, the social uh, life of, of people in another part of, of the island. But uh, from a not particularly informed position, but just a sense of uh, helplessness there, not only were we being ruled from, what, 600 miles away, but a foreign power, the United States, occupied the county I lived in, mm -hmm. uh, making it very uh, vulnerable. Of course, at that time, people still had a notion of the threat a misinformed notion that transpires of the potential threat posed by the Soviet Union. Mm. So there's an example, for instance, of where we've had, you know, I think it's very important that we are upbeat about things. If I told my late father, who's been dead a long time, that the Berlin Wall would be down, there's been significant disarmament, that Nelson Mandela was out of jail, and that Scotland in a few months' time is going to have an independence referendum, that would seem farcical. But here we are, and the future's ours to grab. And that brings us nicely on to the, the last question. How do you think the campaign's going? Well, I think it's going uh, very well. I based that uh, not on a lot of do door knocking in, in uh, the immediate past there, but just in general engagement. I think that the most encouraging thing for me is that uh, the people who have uh, engaged in the process who are of no political background, the S campaign's a very broad kirk. There's a uh, there's various varieties available. Clearly, the No campaign not only just want to make it the SNP version, they want to make it very personal, uh, the attacks on the First Minister, which are to be deplored. I think we need to keep this campaign civil. Um, the most rewarding thing for me is to see the um, numbers that turn out at meetings, and it's been very heartening. I know my colleague spoke at a meeting the other night there with 180 people at it in Avi Moor. I was at a, a village in Barnach just um, a few weeks before that with 50 folk there on a freezing cold Monday night. Um, and not everyone there are yes supporters. Clearly, a, a lot of folk are. There are people that come along and they ask very searching questions. I have to say that they, they ask them about practical things a lot. People go on about the EU and currency. They're both nonsensical issues. You know, man has traded with man, woman with woman, uh, since the beginning of time. And actually, you know, if there's a wall, there's a way, and there's nonsense posturing with the currency. I'm a European citizen, and David Cameron and Alistair Darling are not going to take away my European citizenship. So I think there are a lot of folk who are not engaged, and, and I absolutely understand why. If you're having to worry whether you're going to cook yourself a meal or put on the heating at night because of your financial situation, then Scotland's constitutional future is going to be far from your thoughts. But these are the, exactly the people we need to get to and say, well, maybe there is a better way. There's maybe a much better way. So I'm uh, not one. I do a lot of Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I, I don't tweet polls because I think you tweet them all or you tweet none. So I tweet, tweet, tweet none. There's only one poll that matters. I think that th there is movement. We know that from meetings that we, s we speak at. And increasingly, I want to see more debates rather than yes meetings. I want to see people uh, engaged in debating. And the sampling that takes going in and going out, there's definitely momentum in the direction of yes. And that's all to the good. Uh, yeah, there's been some encouraging signs lately, I think. Um, I'm still convinced we're going to win. What's well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, for the avoidance of doubt, I, I'm sure we will win. I'm not complacent about the, the situation. I think we need to work hard to, to win over people. We need to work hard to retain people who at the moment are su supporting us because the mighty machine of the UK establishment, Project Fear, we ain't seen nothing yet, but we need to embolden you know, our population. And independence is exactly the way to do that, I think. So, uh, John, uh, thanks very much for coming on. That's been brilliant. No, enjoyed that. All the best. Take care, man. So there you go. That was John. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, just the usual messages at the end, just to say I've already got the next one recorded, and that will not quite be on a parliamentary theme. That was with William Duguid, and you may have been enjoying his writings recently. Apart from that, we'll have for all that coming up again at the weekend, and as usual on the podcast, the guest gets to choose the tune, and somewhat surprisingly for me at least, this is what John chose, so I'll speak to you next time. <laughs> Station, station, station. Station, station, station.
Cue lights, cameras, atmospheric buzz Great Britain doesn't suit Captain America All these questions about a government Do we show our first foot of a stiff upper lip? Are we anti-heroic or frantically stoic? Got emotion but can't seem to show it On the bread line or standing below it I'd rather dance with the poets than bank on a bonus Government centre visit London or Edinburgh Leaving the franchise or emptying the register Fighting the power or shooting the messenger Is it Saxons, Romans or Vikings oppressing us? I mean how far back do you go historically? Hunting and gathering, farming and foraging Rule Britannia, cool Britannia, cruel Britannia Do you want to stay the fool Britannia? This is pure anti-hero material Most of the people that I know don't really vote From homeland agents to home regions It's all changing at the polling stations It's pure anti-hero material Sing it on the terraces like here we go, here we go If you do nothing then you can't see changes overdue So let your feet do the talking at the voting booth Alex Salmon said we all must dream It's no surprise that he's prepared to swim upstream What do we all want? Ask the big fish in a small pond One side's Martin Luther, is the other side's Paul Pot Is it King Alex the Enslaver or Alex the Emancipator? Can I answer later, will the Tories hold hands with Labour? Are we oil rich or a subsidised pet? Are we rabble rousers or an organised threat? Sorry, I digress, what about us ordinary folk? It's a lot to digest at the border control Of course, we're all junkies and alkies With Victorian maladies kept and smacked by southern salaries Using rudimentary Tools and making cake drawings, days spent in crack dens, train spotting. Parasitic cancer is sponging off philanthropists. Is why the NHS needs Lansley to dismantle it. Well, if that's what you'd call truthfulness, then the South is all skinheads and football hooligans, waving St George's flags, Terry tapes and wags, lock, stock and cockney rhyming slang, thugs and privately educated Tory tops with a shared affinity for tea and xenophobic thought. All these assumptions lack any insight I'm in surround sound and they're the stereotype This is pure anti-hero material Most of the people that I know don't really vote From homeland agents to home invasions It's all changing at the polling stations It's pure anti-hero material Sing it on the terraces like here we go, here we go If you do nothing then you can't see changes overdue I killed conservative Scotland and it's still dead And the Lib Dems went the same way thanks to Nick Clegg How can you support Tory Britain and Scottish Labour? It's this lack of moral backbone that lost you favour There's a plethora of global issues that haven't right From the Occupy movement to the March for Palestine They give a little perspective on the situation When they start motor bombing my home I'll start fighting for liberation They say if you register to vote you get trapped in the database Stockpile identities cutting passports with razor blades and the census was just another way to appear on the radar Caught in the Big Brother state, let me get this straight You won't vote to conserve personal data management But still have a Facebook page and buy stuff on Amazon Of course you've been watched, it's a modern fact Putting an X in the box says you're watching back This is pure anti-hero material Anti-hero material 